Brilliant. Um, good afternoon and welcome back to the uh, meeting. Um, we are very happy to have uh, Professor Gabriel Mindlin Gabo uh, speak with us today. Gabo is uh, one of is made an absolute uh, remarkable uh, set of studies on bird song on the physics of bird song. Uh, he is a professor of physics at the University of Buenos Aires, uh, and uh, he uh, has over the years, over the past many years, he has produced uh, you know brilliant works on various aspects of uh, songbirds. Uh, their mechanisms for singing and uh, so on. That's what we are going to hear him today. His PhD is from Drexel University uh, in the US uh, and he's been a senior fellow of the Santa Fe Institute uh, for uh, in, in the year 2002. Uh, he was recently elected as fellow of the uh, American Association of, for the Advancement of Science. Well, not so recently, in 2010, he was in, in the, right? And he's uh, been given a prize by the ICTP and so on. We're very happy that uh, Gabo has this, and uh, we look forward to his visit to India to deliver the Turing lectures uh, at some point in time. Gabo. Thank you very much, Ram. <clears throat> Thank you for the invitation, Ram Nilima. I, I look forward to visiting the ICTS as soon as possible, as soon as this <clears throat> crazy times finish. Um, so it's a pleasure to share this work with, with, with you. Today I'm going to be uh, offering a sort of a wide introduction to, to, to the subject. Um, and as Ram was saying, I work at the physics department, although many of the people in my lab are biologists and mathematicians and some physicists. And we are interested, as, as Ram was saying, in the problem of Bertson production. And uh, of course, the first time I heard that there were researchers working in Bertson, I was amazed, amused actually. Um, but then I very early learned that it's an in neuroscience it's a very well established uh, animal model to study the problem of vocal learning we humans learn to vocalize by being exposed to our tutors mom and dad <coughs> sorry <coughs> and we repeat um you know the sounds that we hear and that is not shared by m many other examples in the animal kingdom one of them is uh, the case of bird song for more or less 30 percent of the uh, bird song species that there are there are 10,000 uh, different species of birds approximately 4,000 of them most of them within the passerine order uh, learn to learn to vocalize and also it's a very interesting model to understand the problem of how physics and the neural system um, interact in order for a behavior to emerge. And I'm going to be talking about this, this in particular in the two lectures. Um, when I say that <clears throat> there is some um, learning involved, the systematic study of birdsong and learning in birdsong started, started in, in, in the 50s, last century, when Peter Marler systematically studied the dialects of one kind of sparrow the white crown sparrow. Uh, what I'm displaying here are sonograms, which are spectral representations of the song. Um, each of these uh, lines represent a syllable, and what you see here in this axis is the frequency. Okay, so this corresponds to a whistle, okay, and these down sweeps corresponds to syllables where the frequency of the vocalization goes from a um, high frequency sounds to low frequency sounds and as you can see here for three different individuals they sing more or less similarly and they were recorded in one specific region and you take birds in different regions of the same species and you see that they sing different syllables um, some of them in some region introduce a syllable that is not sung by birds in other regions and so on and of course, the, uh, you know, this was a starting point for uh, taking uh, juveniles from one region and raising them in other regions and seeing, checking that they will learn the dialect of the region where they were 
uh, raised and not where they were born. So this is one species and birds start to communicate and culturally transmit some forms of vocalizations. So this started a wide program of research where of course the brain of a bird is much easier to, to study than the brain of a mammal and we are going to see why in a minute and that allowed us to uh, generate an integrated picture of how learning a complex behavior, behavior takes place. Uh, at the level of the individual bird, here I'm displaying the example of a father and the song of a father, okay, and the song of a juvenile that is learning to sing with the father. And what you see is that, you know, it can reach a, a, a copy, in this case, a very good copy of the, of the song, but then we compare this with the song of a bird that was deafened at birth. And what you see is that, you know, although there are some vocalizations, they are very different than the vocalizations that are characteristic to this species. And of course, this happens with the birds that learn to sing. If you take a pigeon, for example, and you do the same experiment, the pigeon will sing exactly the same, whether you deafen that at birth or whether it was an intact animal. So for some species, there is no learning and the vocalization is programmed in the hardware and for other ones there is a process of evolving in the brain after in, in which after being exposed to the song of the of the of the tutor you know the connections start to uh, evolve in such a way that you can generate the right behavior so <clears throat> instead of starting from the brain i'm going to start from the periphery and i'm going to explain to you how um bird song is produced because the physics involved is much more similar to the physics involved in our sound generation than in, in whistling. Okay, when we imitate a bird, we whistle, but birds don't whistle. What the birds do, is the um, birds have this um, structure, this uh, peripheral device, the seedings, this vocal organ, which is a bipartite structure that is placed at the juncture uh, between the bronchi and the trachea. And there are pairs of labia which are similar to the vocal folds. So when the bird wants to vocalize, it pushes them together, and the earth through that is modulated by the oscillations that are induced by the airflow. And that is how the, the, the sound is generated. When the bird wants to control actually the frequency, it has some muscles that will change the configuration of the ceilings, will stretch the labia, and will generate more. Uh, higher frequency sounds or lower frequency sounds. So basically the bird has to control two things, has to control the configuration, that means the tension of this labia, and of course the respiration that is taking place. Um, <clears throat> so typically what happens is that you generate some modulations of the air uh, due to these uh, labial oscillations, which are nonlinear oscillations, and then those sounds are going to be filtered by, you know, simple linear mechanism, the filter of a tube and the, the filter of the uh, oroesopharyngeal cavity. So you have some spectral content that is very rich because it's generated by these nonlinear oscillations that are then eventually filtered. So how complex are actually the instructions and how complex is, is there for the coding in the brain is a very interesting question because, you know, since the sounds are rich spectrally and, you know, they have all these beautiful modulations and so on, one question is how much of this is coded in the brain and how much is conditioned by the periphery. So one of the first things that we did when we started this uh, line of research is to study the actual, you know, biomechanics of the oscillations that take place in the labia, which are going to be conditioning the spectral features of the sounds. So here what I'm displaying is a very simple model that you can drive for the um, modulation of the labia. So X here is representing the midpoint position of the labia, and what I'm displaying here are just the Newton's equations, if you want, for the, for the motion of a labia. You have restitution constant because it's an elastic material, you have dissipation, you have nonlinear dissipation because the labia are you know, hitting each other or hitting the walls, and then you can compute which is the average pressure when you have this wave-like motion between the, between the labia, because there are basically two active modes that are present, a wave-like one and a lateral one.
And of course, you can transfer energy if the labia are presenting a conversion profile when they are going away from each other because the average pressure is higher, okay? since it's more similar to the air pressure than the atmospheric pressure. And of course, when they are approaching each other with a diversion profile, the average pressure is more similar to the uh, atmospheric pressure that is lower than the air sac pressure. And therefore, you have a higher pressure when they are moving apart than when they are approaching each other. And that's the way in which you have the possibility of transferring energy to the, to the labia. You can compute the actual pressure. You get this thing in here. So the parameter is the pressure of the air sac that, you know, that, that determines the airflow that you have and the tension of the labia that determines uh, which is the frequency at which the labia are going to oscillate. And if you do a normal form calculation, that means you take your equations and you find the simplest, um, the simplest expression by eliminating uh, every non-resonant term, what you get is a very simple differential equation that can display all the dynamical behavior of this labia according to this model. <coughs> And as you can see, there are regions in parameter space where the labia are quotient, are, are stationary, and there are regions in the parameter space where the labia start to oscillate and you generate sound. And you can make the transition towards these oscillations through southern node in limit cycle oscillations or through hot bifurcations, and they were, are going to give rise to oscillations with very different features. For example, when you when an oscillation is born in a southern node in a limit cycle, the oscillations are kind of explosive and are going to be spectrally very rich. But when the oscillations are born in a half bifurcation, the frequency is going to be um, it's going to be a finite value and, and, and the amplitude of the oscillations will start from zero. So they're going to be smooth kind of uh, tonal sounds. And that is very interesting because birds can generate actually spectrally very rich, um, very rich, uh, spectrally very rich sounds or something very tonal. Okay, a zebra fin will have a rough sound particularly for low frequency oscillations. We'll, we'll get to that at some point, either today or on Wednesday. And those rough sounds correspond to oscillations that are being born in this region of parameter space, or they can be tonal like in a canary, okay? And they are typically born in half bifurcations in here. So the biomechanics that is involved conditions severely many of the acoustic features that the song is going to be having. But the actual, uh, gestures are in principle very simple. Um, how realistic can the song of such a simple model be? So I'm going to be showing you an example of a zebra finch. The zebra finch is like uh, the harmonic oscillator of bird song because it's a very tough little animal that can sing all year long, um, learns very, very fast. It's, 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 tough little animal that is very widely studied. The only problem is that the song is very short and it's very ugly. So uh, bear with me. You're going to be listening to something that lasts less than a second and it's this complex song that you see here. So this is the song of the zebra finch. Okay, that's it. Oh, sorry. And here is the song that you can synthesize when you take simple path in parameter space of that normal form that I was showing you before. Okay. Okay. So it's a quite decent representation for being something that is the normal form of a, of a, of a very simple mechanical model. When I say that it's a decent representation is that it captures the features that, for example, the low frequency sounds are spectrally richer than the high frequency sounds and so on. And in, on Wednesday, we're going to be seeing how the brains of the bird react to either of these copies. And we'll see how sensitive they are to the subtleties in the modeling. But the basic idea here is that what the bird has to do, what the brain has to do in order to generate this behavior is quite simple. When you want to generate an absolute sea level, for example, you want to take the labia to this region in parameter space where they start to oscillate. And if you have an absolute sea level, what you have to do is you have to increase the tension while you are generating the sound. And you have to turn the oscillations off of the labia when the frequency is high. 
okay? So by determining the phase difference between these two basic gestures that are the tension of the, of the labia and the pressure, then you can determine very different acoustic features. So for example, you have here a canary song that is changing from an upsweep to a downsweep. And if you want to model that, what you have to change is the phase difference between these two parameters. And you change only that. You have these very simple oscillations, but you change the, the phase um, difference between these oscillations. So you can, you can generate a qualitative change in the, in the output. So once that you see that the behavior can be acoustically complex because of the nonlinearities, but the actual dynamics of the parameters can be more or less simple, you have an idea of the kind of complexity that you're going to be expecting in, in, in the brain and look for that. By the way, <clears throat> one of the things that we've been doing in the lab is actually testing this theory by um, measuring these physiological parameters, physiological parameters. So here what you have is the earthside pressure of the bird while the bird is singing. So here you have the sound, okay, this is the bird singing. And here you have, which is the earthside pressure that is going to be sending the air through the labia. And we measure that by inserting a cannula and sending this cannula to the to a, pressure, a small pressure transducer that we place in a little a backpack here. And then what we can do is to measure the actual tension of the mass, the activity of the muscles that control the tension of the labia. As I was telling you before, this is the seedings, the avian vocal organ. Here inside this bronchi, you have the labia. When you compress these muscles in here, you stretch, okay? You increase the distance between this uh, annuli here, and therefore you stretch the labia the labia are going to start to oscillate at a higher frequency. <clears throat> so you can estimate the frequency of the oscillations by measuring the activity of these masses. Of course, these masses are very tiny, they're a couple of millimeters. So you have to make a very delicate surgery, insert some electrodes here in a way that is not disturbing for the bird because you want the bird to wake up after the anesthesia and start to sing to the female again. But when you do that, eventually you get the EMGs of this labia. And here I'm showing you an example recorded in, in, in our lab, where you have the tension of both labia while the bird is singing. Okay. So how, how are these instructions generated in the brain? So one of the beauties of the, of the bird brain is that when you compare to what Klaus was describing a while ago, uh, you know, the, 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 the mammal brain is very complex and it's, it's, it's very strongly connected and every cognitive activity involves many different regions that are talking to each other. But it's also the case in the, in, in the, in the ocine brain, in the, bird, in the brain of the ocine birds, but it's organized in a more a modular way. So all these regions that you see stained in here are different regions where you have a few hundred thousand neurons that are involved in the generation of the song or the learning of the song, but have a specific role. For example, HVC, <coughs> that is this part of the telencephalon here, is uh, associated to generating some sort of temporal signature uh, the signals there go to RA, where you have different populations that are going to be controlling either the respiration or in N12, you have the neurons that are going to be sending information directly to the, to the muscles in the seedlings. Okay, so you have some temporal clues that are being generated in HVC. In RA, these temporal clues are very close in the brain, but they are going to be controlling either the respiration, that is P, or the tension, that is K, the two basic parameters that I was talking to you about. All these different brain regions are involved in the process of generating the correction signals that would alter the connectivity in between these regions so that you can generate the phase differences that are necessary to um, generate the sound. So, <clears throat> as I was telling you before, you have these different regions, and I'm going to be signaling to some of them particularly. Uh, the pathway that I'm indicating here in black is the motor pathway, the ones that you cannot mess up with if you want to generate the real song. HVC, RA, 
H V C R A, and then from R A you go either to the respiratory nuclei, the nuclei that normally are just oscillating to generate the respiration, but you take over that with the telencephalon when you want to do something different, like singing, and then also from R A you go to um, N twelve that is controlling the seedings. The interesting thing about that is that, is that it is so modular that you can attempt to do some kind of uh, model. So the model I'm going to be describing is a model at the level of the population that will try to generate instructions that are capable of synthesizing song. <coughs> Our first attempt um, uses a representation where every circle in here <coughs> represents a, a neural nucleus. <coughs> Sorry. The dynamics is going to be described in terms of the average activity of the neurons. Okay, so we're using a very simple model, an additive model, something that represents the, the general activity. Um, and we're going to see whether with this model we can generate instructions that are similar to the things that we measure in the lab. So, for example, for modulating, again, this is what the variables indicate, okay? So, when you have a simple oscillation here, what it represents is that the average activity of the spiking activity has an increase where you have the peaks of these uh, average activities. Um, this is like a wilson co one, a very simple additive model where the, the, this is a sigmoidal function that will send saturation. So, <coughs> in our model, what we're going to have is this a set of differential equations that are coupled, and the output will be the respiratory gestures, which we want them to reproduce what we measure when we insert our a pressure transducer cannula in the air sac of the singing brain. So we know that the output that we want to generate when we accommodate the connectivity in this uh, circuitry that we know from anatomy is that the output has to correspond to this temporal time series. Temporal time series that, by the way, is a, can be modeled by a very low dimensional dynamical system by changing its parameters. This is something that blows my mind every time that I see the data. Okay, you can take a, a very simple low dimensional oscillator, force it, change for different harmonic solutions, and you get time series that are very similar to what we record. So here we have the result of trying to reproduce with this model, for example, a syllable like, uh, sorry, this is wrong, this, this should be signaling this, okay, this P0 activity. So here we have the result of simulating this neural network when we properly um, weight the connectivities and we generate a gesture that is similar to uh, these sea levels that are the whistle sea levels. And in here, what we have is the result of <coughs> uh, running our simulations, trying to generate simple sea levels that are simple sea levels like the ones that I call P1. So there are two interesting things about this. One is that the model can be, a model that is so simple can generate things that look similar to what we record. This is one aspect of the model. Okay, the model is plausible, okay? We can generate a low-dimensional model that can synthesize sounds, uh, sorry, uh, temporal signals that are very similar to the physiological gestures that we measure. But the most interesting thing is that they can also predict, according to the model, what kind of neural activity we're expecting in different regions of the circuitry. For example, in order to generate the signal, <coughs> What this model says is that we would need to have, in average, peaks at the beginning of the syllable. Or in this case in here, if you want to generate these rapid oscillations, you would need, in HVC, an activity that, in average, has pulsations at the frequency of those oscillations. And those are quantitative predictions that can guide your experimental work in the neural aspect of the study of Birdsong. And this is what we do also in the lab. So besides working on the physiology, um, we can insert electrodes <coughs> in the different regions of the brain and test the activity. So again, how close can we get when we use this very simple model 
in order to try to reproduce these respiratory gestures? Well, the answer is that you can get very close. So here you have experimental data from our lab measuring the activity in canaries. And here what you have is the result of our numerical simulations of our numerical simulations by integrating the equations of this low dimensional model. So <coughs> my colleague Ana Malor in the lab, she introduces these electrodes, um, these high impedance electrodes in different regions of the brain. And in this case, what I'm showing you is what happens when she measures the activity of HVC, this nucleus in the telencephalon, while the bird is singing. So now instead of using these physiological variables like the ERSAC pressure in the, the pressure in the ERSACs uh, to try to see where we will produce the right results, we're using the predictions of the model to see whether we see the kind of activity that is predicted by it. Okay, this required according to the model to generate the right instructions. So here you have the sound that corresponds to the whistles this high, almost constant frequency sounds with a little note here before. And when you look at the activity, typically what you see is this kind of activity at the beginning of the syllable, like the prediction of the model. Or when you have this, uh, what we call P1 syllables, these very um, rapid syllables in here, you, ha you have in HVC an activity that is modulated by the same frequency than the sound. <coughs> Here we have the collected data from taking many birds singing the same syllable or the bird singing the same syllable in different depth within HVC. And what you see is this uh, higher frequency of uh, pulses at the beginning, okay, the beginning of the syllable, like it was predicted by the model. And at the end, that is something that is not necessary in the model, but can happen. So here is the prediction of the model, the simplest prediction of the model, okay, with the prediction uh, of having uh, this heterogeneity at the beginning of the syllable that can be reproduced by the, by the data. So <clears throat> another thing that we did in order to build confidence on these models is try to manipulate these oscillations. <clears throat> Sorry, here you have the same um, kind of uh, test by measuring the collective activity of spikes in while well, the bird is singing these rapid syllables and the prediction of the model. Okay. So how realistic can these uh, synthetic songs that are generated when this synthetic model drives the synthetic low dimensional biomechanical model that I described at the beginning? very realistic. So here you have the real song, and here you have a synthetic song that is generated by a synthetic brain structure driving the synthetic biomechanics. And what you get is that the sound that you, ge that you generate is something that is good, reasonably good. Actually, it's good enough to get a female very interested in this kind of uh, synthetic robot. This is uh, something I can talk about on Wednesday if you, if you want. This is a behavioral it works that a graduate student in the lab, uh, Gonzalo Uribarri, has been doing the last years before the pandemic. Okay, um, <clears throat> but in order to, <clears throat> to build this um, confidence on these kind of models, uh, we reproduced a technique that was originally uh, developed by Michael Long, who now works in NYU, and Michael C in, in MIT. What they did is something very smart. They took these um, cooling devices, the Peltier devices, and they started to um, cool one of the regions of the brain. And when they started to cool this, the first thing that they noticed is that the song became um, slower, and they, you know, they could stretch the duration of the song. Um, we built on that result and built these coolers in order to see whether uh, in our experiments, in our animal model, we could see the effect. But again, since we have this specific model, we wanted to see which are the qualitative changes that you're expecting to have 
in the physiological gestures when you manipulate the temperature. So here is a cooler. It's a very small Peltier device that is connected to the brain, and it has these connectors here so that go right to HVC. Here we have some cooling device for the Peltier, so you have water circulating in there. It's kind of, it's kind of a subtle experiment. But the prediction of the model is the following. <clears throat> the prediction of the model is that if you uh, have all the temporal structures uh, unchanged, but one, and that one is changed, so you can make a prediction of how the final stage of the model will be. So here you have what the model predicts for, uh, required for generating one particular gesture. So you need some specific pulse at some region in HVC. And then you simulate the cooling by doing what actually the cooling does, that is, in this region of the brain, make it slower. All the rest of the temporal uh, constants in the, in, the, in the model are unchanged. And the prediction is that what you do is that you uh, <clears throat> deform this pulse by increasing the depth of this minimum uh, in the gesture. And then you go to the experiment and slowly change the current through the Peltier in order to, in, to increase the uh, cooling and, and, and measure how the song is being deformed. So here what I'm showing is the ERSAC pressure while the bird is singing, while I'm changing the temperature in the Peltier. And what happens is that the song starts to be deformed in the same way as we predict with the model. Actually, if you want to listen to the song and how it deforms when you, when you start to do this procedure, this is how the, sound, uh, how the song sounds at normal temperature. This is when you start to cool. And this is when you cool further. And you have that the long whistles start to have minima in the middle and you listen to these uh, broken sea levels, okay? And you break it in, in, in many pieces. So you can actually operate on the brain in order to induce the changes that you're predicting uh, by the model. So the model is not only interpretative or can, uh, you know, a posteriori, in, you know, reproduce the data, but allow you to have interventions where you make a quantitative prediction and you, and you test it. So <clears throat> this is the presentation that I wanted to share with you. Um, on this uh, animal model. And let me summarize this by, by telling you the following. Um, Bertson is an ideal model for the study of how complex behavior is learned and generated. And again, uh, the reason for which I'm so enthusiastic about this animal model is that, first of all, there is some learning, which is non trivial. So, in the process of studying how uh, a neural architecture generates some behavior, uh, this is a beautiful example of how this architecture is evolving in time according to some, you know, sensor, sensorial clues that are sent at some point of the development. Um, it is a complex behavior because some is complex, but the complexity is shared. By this, what I mean is that some of the features that make birds on rich are determined by the biomechanics. So the instructions are somehow complicated because you have to, have to generate different rhythms and so on, but basically there are oscillations, repetitive oscillations, so you have to control the phase difference from them. So the part of the complexity um, that is uh, performed or carried by the biomechanics is not low. Okay, so it's interesting. You, you have something that is more or less simple from the point of view of the instructions that generates a complex behavior, but where part of the complexity is the biomechanical complexity. And one thing that I find absolutely fascinating is that there is evidence of low dimensional dynamics in the generation of the physiological instructions. So, for example, when I was showing you the, uh, the ERSAC pressure, that the canary uses in order to generate the song, those can be reproduced as the different subharmonics 
of a nonlinear dynamical system that is periodically forced. So you get something as simple as a, a Wilson Coban oscillator, or even if you can use the normal form of a, a, a Van der Poel oscillation and, and drive it at different frequencies, and you will get solutions which are very similar to the solutions of this uh, ERSAC pressure. So if you think that this emerges from a brain with many nuclei, each of them with hundreds of thousands of neurons, but collectively have something that is low dimensional nonlinear dynamics, to me is fascinating. And gives hint of having an animal model where you can actually do some um, nonlinear analysis or statistical analysis uh, that has some you know, chance of, of being contrasted against experiments. So this, this evidence of low dimensional dynamics in the generation of physiological instructions, to me, is something very interesting for this animal model. Actually, I'm not showing you uh, this today, but you can take this segment and do some of the typical analysis that you used to do in nonlinear dynamics a few years ago, like embedding the solution, studying its topological structure, and the different solutions correspond to periodic orbits of a low dimensional, a periodically driven dynamical system. <clears throat> and another aspect which I think it's really interesting, and particularly for physicists, is that biomechanics and its nonlinearities allow a good reconstruction of the behavior with relatively simple physiological instructions. What I was telling you before, you can get a complex song like the zebra finch that has very low frequencies of high uh, spectral content and high frequency sound which when you listen to it gives you this idea of very complex and mind-blowing sounds and you can reproduce them by thinking that your biomechanics or testing that your biomechanics is very close to a sudden node in the limit cycle bifurcation that allows you to explain why the low frequency sounds are spectrally very rich because they're born you know, in a limit cycle that it has a region with the critical slowing down. And then when you move away from the bifurcation, you have almost a tonal sound. So much of the complexity and the richness of the sound can be explained by the biomechanics. And this is something very interesting because conceptually, I think that neuroscience usually thinks that you have the brain that has all this beautiful statistical properties and fascinating network properties and so on that is driving some dummy robot. And I think that that's not the case. Behavior emerges out of the interaction of a nervous system and biomechanics. And it's very interesting to see how the biomechanics conditions what the brain will ultimately do in order to generate the behavior. And this is something I want to focus on next uh, next lecture by studying in detail the problem of uh, respiration and this is the presentation of the subject and i hope uh, it was clear or motivating and thank you very much for the invitation thank you gabo it was brilliant um and uh, you know again let me just invite everybody to uh, ask their questions but uh, would you please um, identify yourself unmute yourself and go ahead and ask um, uh, Gabo, uh, a question. How much of what you have inferred for bird song uh, could be transferred to uh, mammalian uh, systems? Um, I mean, what I was wondering was that do we whistle in the same way? Uh, you think that there's something about the whistling? Uh, not, not all speech, but maybe just a portion of the sounds that we make. Right, right. Well, that's very interesting. So <clears throat> the basic physics that I was describing, uh, where you generate like a sound at one kilohertz by moving a labia, is the same physics that we humans use when we generate a vowel at 100 hertz. But the interesting thing is that if you do the scaling and you measure 1.8 meters and weight, I don't know, 100 kilograms. If you reduce it to 18 centimeters and 18 grams and, and yeah, 18 centimeters, then your 100 hertz frequency uh, maps into one kilohertz. So the reason is scaling involved where what they are doing is basically saying A, eh, ah, something like that, but they're very small and it sounds like 
okay, like a, like a whistle to us. Uh, so there is some uh, shear mechanisms of, of uh, sound production that are, you know, like typical of mammalian uh, sound production. Um, of course, it is not the only sound that they produce. And one of the interesting things that I've been working on in, in this field is that if you go not to the ocine case, so here, here's how it goes. You have like 20 something different orders of birds. Passerines are one of those 20 something orders. And ocine brain, uh, birds are part of the passerines. These are 4,000 species. But then you have 6,000 other species and in most of them there is no learning. So in those cases you have a wide diversity of biomechanics that is involved in the generation of the sounds and they found different strategies that are mapped into their brains and the periphery in order to generate, the, to find their, their place in the acoustic night. So when you don't have the possibility of learning you modify your anatomy or the biomechanics and you have some species where you uh, modulate by um, detuning the two sound sources. You have other species that develop a third uh, sound source, some species that use whistles actually, actually whistles. So my experience is that when you don't have learning, you have a very wide diversity of biomechanics and physics involved in the generation of the sounds. And then there is the, the question of how much you learn about um, the learning itself by studying uh, birds. And there are beautiful studies by Patricia Kuhl, that is a psychologist of UCSF, that worked together with Alison Dope, which was a brilliant neuroscientist in UCSF, uh, where they do this comparative analysis of how the learning stages evolved in humans and in birds, and the similarities are attention. So there is a lot being uh, studied in the comparison between the learning in these two cases. Mm -hmm. Okay, um, are there questions, please? Uh, uh, yeah, I have. Go ahead. Yeah, hi, this is Rutuparna. Uh, so I actually wanted to, I was more curious about the fact that, so these songbirds, the uh, syllabus that they generate or they produce when they're interacting in a, in a natural uh, in a natural environment versus when they are uh, exposed to some kind of stress, like, you know, they have some fear contextual, they might just uh, demonstrate some contextual fear uh, behavior. So in that case, uh, the uh, syllables, are they, the, gen, uh, the syllables that are generated, are they the same as the one that they would have generated in a natural environment? Or, I mean, have studies been done on that? Uh, right. Yeah. So <clears throat> in the case of the zebra finch, that is the case that I was showing, what makes it very very easy for the study is that they learn. It takes you know several months actually to actually learn. They have a first stage where they just listen to the song of the tutor. They allegedly uh, make a template for how they want to sound. Then they practice, and eventually, after you know a, a few months, they develop their adult song. But when they have learned that song, what they do is they sing repeatedly that one song. So, for example, in the case I was showing you uh, at the beginning, this um, syllable that, uh, that the zebra finch was doing, this one here, okay, the bird, it will take a few months to, to learn this song, but then it will sing this song over and over. And when it practices every day, it will practice exactly that song over and over. Of course, when it wants to sing it to the female, it will look straight at her, it will have behaviorally this behavior where it will stare at her and sing it repeatedly with an amazing precision. So one thing that changes when the bird is just practicing or when the bird is singing a directed song is that the temporal variation is much smaller, but it's the same set of syllables. So you can see whether your interventions, for example, or whatever, are change, changing the behavior because you have a stereotype behavior where you measure for hundreds or thousands of times the song, and when you are recording the variables and you look at the, at the impact, you can see whether there was a change or not. Of course, there are distress calls, there are calls 
that they use when they they, they want to avert the, you know they want to tell the, their mates that there is a danger uh, they are calling each other all the time so behaviorally there are things that you know can be um, identified as the stress signals stress signals and so on but you can see whether what you're studying it is the stereotype song because it will repeat it without any kind of variation. Okay, yeah, thank you. It's, it was an interesting talk. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Uh, hi, this is uh, Collins, and I have a question. Can I go ahead and ask? Yeah, sure. Yeah. Uh, so uh, I, uh, the question I had is about how do you map the physical system? To the normal, to the parameter space in the normal form. So, for example, are there disallowed space, parts of the parameter space the physical system can't visit? Uh, is the uh, as the frequency changes? Is it always a contiguous trajectory through that parameter space? How how do you uh, map from one to the other? Okay, so what we did. Uh... When we started studying this for this very mechanical model, uh, we started to look in all its diversity what the behaviors could, 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 could present. We focused on the regions where you could have um, oscillations. So we found, uh, we developed the normal form where you would have uh, the richest variety of oscillations. So we, 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 we found the the parameters where you would have a Tuggins Bogdanov bifurcation, so you would have the degeneration between a Hof and a, and a saddle node. And then we started to work under the hypothesis that the phonation will be around that region in parameter space. So what we did is we scaled equations with gamma, which is a scaling of the, of the frequency. And for the different species, what we do is we uh, fit the gamma. So that will tell you which is the spectral uh, richness that you would have for some particular frequency, okay? Because in a southern node, in a, for, for, for example, in a southern node in a limit cycle bifurcation, what you will have is that the spectral richness will be given by the closeness to the bifurcation. But which is the actual frequency that you will have for a particular um, spectral richness can be scaled by this gamma here. So what we did is for different species, we fitted the gamma. All of them go within the ranges of the parameters that are realistic for the birth. So when you introduce a tension, we see that the tension would correspond to the uh, elastic tension of a muscle. For the pressure, we do have calibrated pressure. So for the pressure, we know the exact values of the parameters. But the gamma constant here was uh, measured for every species in such a way that the uh, one particular oscillation will have the right spectral content at the right frequency. And then what you see is that when you want to generate the other, you know, the other uh, C levels, the other C levels will match, uh, will have the consistent fundamental frequency with the right spectral content. So for all the species that we studied, the normal form with a proper scaling factor are enough to reproduce the, the solutions. Thank you. From Zuhre Dali, please. Uh, hello. Would you like to please? Yeah, yeah. Gamrel, uh, I have one question. Uh, see, uh, I miss I miss your video because of power cut off, but still asking. Uh, uh, see, uh, I was uh, working on idea like, you know, finding out the alphabets uh, of the birds. Like, you know, in, in our language, we used to have alphabets. We, we are having alphabet A, B, C, D. Okay. And using that alphabet, we form the words and using the words, we form the sentence and then paragraphs. So if we are able to identify uh, the alphabets of the bird uh, communication whenever bird communicate to each other with their sounds if we find alphabets and then we can build words for them and we can communicate uh, with that so uh, sound if we know uh, this word means uh, these things or this word is using in this context so is uh, uh, is it doable Okay, well, it's a, it's a beautiful question. There is no indication 
that they use um, different uh, gestures or different sounds or different kind of uh, yeah, kind of syllables or, or, or sounds or minimal units in a combinatorial way in order to convey meaning. So in that regard, it's very different from a language. So what they learn is a vocalization, but they don't learn a language. They don't use combinatorial um, sequences of sounds in order to convey different uh, meanings. Uh, what they usually at least that no one has uh, figured out. Uh, behaviorally, what they do is they make this uh, beautiful display of skills and they use it either for trying to seduce a female or to um, uh, negotiate territories with another male. What they do have in many species is specific sounds that are associated to particular meanings like for example uh, some alert calls when you mm -hmm. have uh, some predator that, that is approaching in some species you have a specific sound that is indicating that that predator is coming uh, and stuff like that but there is no indication that they will use the different sounds that they can produce combinatorially in order to have a semantics uh, that as far as we know uh, doesn't happen uh, and typically even when you have uh, birds that learn that they will learn is a variety of, of, of uh, songs and they will sing them more or less with the stereotypy the archetypical case is the zebra finch that will learn only one song um, but even the ones that have repertoires of different songs they won't change it in order to convey different meanings in different contexts okay they will choose to sing one or the other for example in the case where there are dialects if they sing two or three songs and another bird in another dialect has different two or three songs when they want to uh, when they want to negotiate their territories they will sing the common song and things like that but they don't combine in a semantic way but uh, there should be some unique pattern like you know if there is a context like let us say earthquake is going to come okay and before the five minutes or one minutes uh, like you know some animals use signals okay and that signals are very unique uh, in that context and they don't generally uh, 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 speak that kind of signal if we consider context and the sound as a signal and if you map and if you find principal component in that whole signal and if you find let us say 12 principal components and if you take any other uh, signal and uh, we can find out those 12 principal component would be there i mean uh, any new signal will consist of using those 12 principal components so we can in this way we can build the language for animals and we can generate synthetic sound and we can communicate with them so I was thinking like that. Well, it would be wonderful. I mean, I, I, I don't know that anyone has, has done it, and maybe it's a brilliant idea, and I I don't know. I, I haven't seen it. It never occurred to me or to anyone that I know, but maybe it's a way to go. So I, I don't know. Okay, okay, okay. <laughs> but it sounds interesting. The new doctor do little. <laughs> thanks, thanks, Gabriel. <laughs> uh, Gabo, are there any further questions? Uh, yeah, uh, I was just wondering uh, one thing: is this, uh, you know, you you at the end of the day, you come with a one-dimensional model? Yeah, a low, a very low-dimensional model. Yes. Yeah. Um, have you tried a higher dimensional model and seen that it does it's not any better at all or is this uh... no that's very interesting one thing that i'm i've been doing is uh, the following um uh, is very interesting so what i try to do is for example work in models of agc or ra and try to make a network of oscillators and tune the constants of the mm -hmm. coupling of those oscillators in order to the average activity reproduce this kind of low dimensional dynamics. Um, for example, using this uh, Ott and Antonsen uh, ansatz, okay, so what we work with, with uh, uh, populations of uh, excitatory and inhibitory neurons, and we computed the average dynamics of those uh, 
of those uh, collective uh, sets of oscillators and tune the parameters in such a way that you will get something similar to the kind of uh, phenomenological equations that uh, you were mentioning, the additive models. So what we found is that we can have in average um, a, an activity that reproduces the kind of uh, sudden node in limit cycle bifurcations that the typical additive models have and so on. Um, one of the papers that I sent uh, for uh, for material uh, summarizes those uh, average calculations that we that we've been doing. Um, so what we found is, is that in average we can reproduce the same dynamics as the low dimensional dynamics, but I never quantified the difference of uh, the actual uh, average that you will have. And that means the, the, the fluctuations and where that would give more realism to the to the sounds that I have never. Um, quantified or, 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 or pursued. I only studied the compatibility between a higher dimensional model and the average activity. It's interesting to see whether the diversity, mm -hmm. and actually it's a very interesting question right now that you mention it, because mm -hmm. one, one, one aspect is that when we try behaviorally, what happens in the brain of a bird that is listening to the song, to have fluctuations and to have noise added to the physiological parameters is key to having a realistic response. So maybe it's an interesting thing to, 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 to do, to actually generate instructions with a higher dimensional model and see where you have um, something that doesn't require an external noise production. It's an interesting idea. Yeah, I, I haven't done it. I haven't done, for example, the behavioral experiment of exposing a bird to synthesis as it generated by high dimensional model. And I think it's a very nice idea. Okay. Yeah. That, that would be interesting. Right? Yeah. Very interesting, okay. very interesting, um, very nice. Well, it's actually time for... Um, so, uh, Nilima, if you are there, would you please uh, take over and guide us into the breakout room.